right, it looks like we're ready to uh, start the meeting. First item on our agenda is a removal of the draft minutes from our previous meeting in April. Has everyone had a chance to review the minutes? Actually, this is the first time you guys made them, so you couldn't be told. So February and April. Oh, February and April. Yeah. Okay, so two meeting sets of meeting minutes. And were there any questions about the minutes? And if there are no questions, is there a motion for approval for both February and April? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So moving on to the next item, GRTC project updates from the Sam. Thank you, Thank you Madam Chair. Uh, we'll start off with the North-South BRT study. Um, so I believe uh, when last we spoke, uh, we were gearing up for some public involvement. Uh, we were able to have that first round of uh, pop-up meetings and uh, in-person public meetings uh, back in late April, early May. Um, we had good turnout for those. Uh, we were very pleased. Um, a lot of folks came out. And so after that, uh, we began to look at the sort of qualitative data that we had pulled for each of the different segments and piece together uh, individual alternatives. And so what we're doing now is kind of finalizing with the jurisdictions what those alternatives will be. Uh, we anticipate completing that uh, within the next probably a week or two, uh, and then going on to doing that more intensive uh, quantitative evaluation of each alternative uh, before ultimately selecting one uh, at the end of the summer. So that's what's coming up on that. That project is still on schedule. The East End Transfer Hub Study, um, I think this one may have just kicked off when we last met. Um, this is a study to look at a or locate a replacement location for 23rd and Franklin transfer area. Uh, this is a transfer area in our east end of the city uh, where currently we have some challenges due to the grade, uh, the pavement is really beat up, uh, don't have quite the level of amenities that we'd like to see. So we're looking to, to identify a new location through this study. Um, engage consultant help to do that. We have identified uh, potential universe of alternatives. Uh, we've been working with the city uh, to you know, get their input on that. We are currently at a point where we're completing the initial evaluation matrix uh, that's got information, like traffic impacts, environmental impacts, and we'll be presenting that to the city uh, to then kind of get their feedback. And ultimately we want them to sort of help us winnow down these eight to 10 options that we have now to three, which we will prepare conceptual site layouts for, uh, and then ultimately go forward with single site based on the city's additional input. Would you purchase the property? Um, we're focusing on city-owned properties. Uh, and we're also looking at on-street operations. So leasing from the city? That may be the, yes, that, that's definitely a potential. Um, our next project, uh, the microtransit implementation plan, you're actually going to hear more about this uh, from Adrian, so I won't belabor it, uh, but we have been hard at work uh, creating the, we've been working on the financial plan and um, the operational plan and communications plan tasks lately. Uh, we wrapped up the initial um, zone refinement plan, um, so we're, we're kind of switching gears a little bit and moving quickly towards the beginning of the procurement, uh, and we still anticipate being able to roll out the first microtransit zone in September. Uh, transit strategic plan, this is another one you will be hearing more about from Tricia, the project manager of that one. Uh, this is a plan required by DRPT. It replaces the transit development plan, or TDP. Uh, this TSP will be a 10-year plan for how we plan to uh, improve and expand service uh, over the next few years. Uh, moving on to dedicated lane study. This project kicked off last week, actually. Uh, so we are still in the process of uh, pulling together all our data needs and identifying stakeholders and kind of setting up our bi-weekly meetings. So this one's just getting rolling. Um, 
This will be, I believe, 40, either 42 or 46 week long study. We'll first be looking at where we can expand dedicated lanes on the existing pulse alignment. Uh, and then the second phase of the study will concentrate on where we can implement dedicated lanes in the uh, local route network and future PRT network. So that's just getting started. And the next project update is the zero emission vehicle transition plan. Uh, we've received a draft technology evaluation uh, and are kind of incorporating our feedback into that. Um, so the next activities or next steps are the final technology evaluation report, the draft transition plan that kind of provides a blueprint for how we want to transition uh, from our current fleet of CNG and diesel to a, a portion or all of our fleet being zero emission. And that should wrap up in July. Next project is the facilities master plan. That's um, So this project is looking, it's kind of building off of the zero emissions vehicle transition plan in part, because um, obviously if we're going to add a new vehicle technology, there will probably be some infrastructural needs associated with that that we want to incorporate into our facility. Um, and it's also looking at how are we allocating space in our current facility? Uh, where do we need to maybe change how things are laid out, where people are? Um, basically, how have our needs changed in the last 10 years, or 13 years since this building was built? And how is it projected to change in the next you know, 10, 20 years? What should we be planning for? And part of that is you know, now that we have the church lot at 325 Belt Boulevard, what is the long range plan for that parcel? Uh, how will we utilize that? Uh, so this task, it kicks off in the April, and it is projected to finish in October, and we're still on schedule with that. We are in the process of uh, kind of wrapping up some loose ends on the needs assessment, and we'll be moving on to developing a program of projects. Yeah, the image there showing a physical <laughs> of building configuration. Yes. Is, do you have a an, an sort of a uh, idea sketch of what what types of spaces will be need needed to handle the zero emission vehicle program that are different from what they are today? What what are those spaces? Is, you know, I I think if you're moving to you know you're moving to all electric, you need to have more of a you know some kind of a grid room or something. I don't know what 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 does that space configuration need in the future that we don't have now? Yeah, so we're still determining that in general. I will say that for hydrogen technology, the, the footprint of what you need and the type of infrastructure you need is kind of similar to what you have with CNG um, in terms of you know, having a fuel that needs compression and pump in that way. Um, however, there may be a potential to generate some power on site and develop your own fuel, and that would require an even larger footprint. With battery electric, obviously, you have uh, the charging overhead charging spaces that you'll need uh, out in the yard, uh, you may need a structure over those. Um, there's a lot to be done between the, uh, the box where we connect to Dominion and that end of line where the charging actually happens. Um, so it's going to de be dependent upon what we kind of select and what mix we go with um, in terms of conventional fuels versus zero emissions. But the reality is, is this image here sort of depicts a lot of office side. They, you, we're talking about the whole infrastructure. We're talking yes. about all building infrastructure. Yes. How does that change when we go to ZEVs. Yeah. And the facilities master plan in conjunction with the ZEVs will account for that and okay. determine what that layout needs to be. I sort of jumped on the office side. Of yeah. I, I was like, I, I don't have great no changes with that. How, how much does that change? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. The, uh, the office space. Um, you know, I, I think we're determining how much that's going to change. You know, there's a balance between do you want to put a lot of resources into trying to fit within your existing envelope as much as possible and minimize your administrative needs on 325 and whatever gets developed there, you know, versus we want to spend less of our resources on existing administrative and focus more on what can we build. So that these are questions that we're kind of beginning to grapple with through this planning process. Um, really just started wrapping up the uh, 
that needs assessment and an idea of, okay, here's how many people we think we'll have in 10, 20 years and right. how these different departments might grow and organize differently. So, okay. Just thinking about zero emissions, um, the needing to charge a bus, you just don't pull up to the pump and charge it and then run off. Yep. Because it needs a lot of time, so that means a lot of space for those overhead units. Yep. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see a site plan that shows. We will definitely be briefing as we kind of get closer to decision on those technologies and how that may impact our footprints on this campus. Are y'all also looking at needs outside of your main headquarters or facilities that would be more than just a transfer center, but like operations? Um, this plan is focused on this campus, 301 and 325. Um, you know, I think we, we do have a plan to look for a permanent downtown transfer station facility. Um, we, we think we can accommodate most of our administrative and maintenance group on this campus, but additional facilities like the transfers and parking lights and things will be uh, dealt with in studies outside of this plan. I've always wondered whether um, having small sort of satellite spots for buses to play over and start the night thing, whether that made sense instead of bringing everybody. I think um, the as we go through that TSP process, you know, there may be things that come out of that that we'll have to go back and update the facility master plan to do um, you know, with CDPA and becoming a more regional agency, regional provision of service. I, I think there's potential in the future to need a satellite maintenance facility, um, but the, so far the analysis hasn't shown a need for that yet. But you know, it's something. And Cheryl may remember back when your campus first moved down here from from um, San yeah, Davis. Um, there was discussion of the need for a north side facility. We looked at some stuff here. So, technology changing, like for battery charging or something. Yeah. Might be clicked out from here. Thanks. The yeah. next project is the uh, demolition and remediation plan for the for 325 Felt Boulevard. Uh, the plan, we're doing just the planning for how we will remediate uh, mold and asbestos uh, conditions there and then demolish that building. And then the next phase of this project will be uh, the design of a paving paved surface so that we can park buses there. Um, that is a federally funded project uh, and the construction of that. Facility. And that's kind of the uh, intermediate plan for 325 Bell Boulevard until we can you know, figure out exactly what we want to do with that parcel long term and secure the funding and do all the design work for that. Um, let's see, the pulse station modifications. Um, so, we did receive funding to purchase uh, some articulated vehicles. Uh, this will necessitate the need to modify our existing pulse stations a little bit. Uh, the primary thing, the primary thing we need to modify is uh, knocking down that knee wall, uh, the brick knee wall that's on the station, so that we can extend the platform length. Um, so we are currently doing the design work for that. Um, we should get our 30% design uh, within the next week or two uh, for us to review and then go back to the city and talk through that. Um, so we're on track to complete that design work in October, and then we can begin construction on those platform modifications. The modifications 100% to assist with the articulated um, vehicles, or are there things that we've learned from the rollout of the faults that we're also modifying to improve? Or is, it, is it simply to allow for the longer units to, to, to operate properly? It is, but we actually are ending up taking care of one of the kind of recurring operational issues uh, in, with those knee walls. Um, they they have been hit several times, certain locations. So this is kind of it was it, that was an issue in, in and of itself. Yeah, that you can solve with this. Exactly. All right. 
And on the next one, uh, we will end with downtown transfer station, uh, construction of this temporary transfer facility. Um, substantial construction work is complete. Um, we have had a, a few issues with uh, power source not being where we thought it would be uh, and kind of getting communications equipment uh, installed and all signed off on. So we're working through those, um, but we have delayed the opening of this until mid-July. Uh, we haven't settled on an official date yet, uh, but we hope to in the coming weeks. Um, and we are also kind of waiting to install uh, the shelters and the operator restroom and the um, e-paper signage until we get closer to that date. So uh, it remains in good condition. That is all I had. Any questions? Oh, speedy. Anyone? Yeah, <laughs> speedy. Uh, just to slow things down a little bit. Um, uh, North South BRT. Yes. Uh, just as information more than anything else, I wanted to share that um, I've asked for a meeting with Chesterfield County, some of the staff there, uh, so that I can ask a few questions regarding um, essentially the big picture question is Chesterfield fully taking advantage of this time in thinking through what the future of its land use plan is going to be. Remember when we started talking about how the pulse is sort of, we, we, we built out the Broad Street um, um, circuit, but when I asked the question about now how does that tie into Scott's addition, all these others, and how has that maybe been proactively thinking about what's coming, it's been sort of reactionary. And obviously I want this to be the BRT anywhere it goes to be as successful as possible. And so if we can take cues from what opportunities there are with BRT and maximize the land use plans, then, then I want to do that. And so I'm going to be largely asking questions myself. I'm going to coordinate with Barb before that um, meeting. You'll be in that meeting, I think, Barb, as well. And it's just me catching up and making sure that the questions are being asked at this time. So I just want everybody to be aware that I'm doing that because I want this uh, expansion to be as successful as it can be. I think that's wonderful. And if there's any information we can provide, uh, just let us know. Okay. Anyone else have questions on the project status update? Okay. Along then to uh, the microtransit pilot invitation. It is a update on that. Yeah. Um, so Sam came to the high level with a little bit more detail on kind of where we are now and what it looks like for next steps. Um, right, so um, we find so we have been deep in that since we um, kicked it off. We have had two or three. With jurisdiction um, going over what the zone ended up like at the end of the you know, first phase analysis. Um, this gave us an opportunity to talk to a profit organization, other agencies that uh, were low and trying to benefit population to make sure the zone were what they need to be. Um, and of course, a big benefit of microtransit was missing the street and still kind of move it out if necessary. Um, we have also been working on the operational method for it and have decided that just starting it off, um, doing all of them turnkey. Originally, we talked about doing two or three of them, depending um, on the agency of our current footprint um, network. We have those as GRTC operating rules. This is new for us. We have to build up all of our fixed route operations, getting that to where it needs to be before we start competing with ourselves. Um, in terms of operators. Um, so we are hoping that we can uh, get the other zones migrated, like two of the zones migrated over maybe by next summer uh, to be in and out to work on those operations parallel. Um, so with that, we've been working on standards, working structure, I think we have those um, in place. And then uh, policy recommendation, um, they want the union contract, um, fair policy, and all of that. So some of those will actually come back for review. Uh, right now, this is being approached as pilot, and as long as our, I should say as long as, but also our current system is zero fare, so approaching this in the same sort of uh, situation as zero fare, at least starting off, but we'll come to the board and 
determine what should be that big cost for this service. Um, I have this marked at 90 percent because a lot of the no trial profiles have been set, but some of the jurisdictions um, I'll go through as far as like phase implementation. Um, some of the ones that are more in the outer, so more towards spring, summer of next year, um, will are still looking at some of those refinements. We have to do some additional probably feasibility, um, some engagement to see where the cutoff should be. So, um, same, all of that, of course, is tied into the operation of capital costs, tied into what happens above. Now, the communication plan has been happening in parallel. Um, going through lots of meetings um, with us to understand what, how we are, want the new service to proceed. And then, of course, there's going to be, um, it'll be dependent on the jurisdiction as far as what, what would demographic primarily targeted. Um, so, working on that. An example of that is, for example, like Ashland has a uh, rent of Macon. So, you'll probably have a lot more younger individuals who need this. So, what is the outreach method for them opposed to like a Powhatan? Um, we'll have a completely different demographic. So, working with those. We'll have a toolkit that will have um, everything in it as far as marketing communication, but we'll cater specifically to the demographics of that particular uh, zone. Um, here at Support, we started that conversation um, trying to determine if we had a RFP. We plan on taking that out as soon as we can because September, October, or like tomorrow. Um, and want to be able to have be able to actually uh, start this um, plan. And then I have nothing that's implementation support, but we have um, the contractor uh, with us for at least three, six months after to continue um, to, to monitor it, to coach us as we um, start to take this on account. This just shows that same timeline of uh, the different format, so I'm not going to go through that. Um, I'm excited to show for the first time uh, the first audience that we have picked a brand. Uh, I'm like looking at bar, but this looks familiar. <laughs> I'm sure, but we did have a service called Chesterfield Link. Um, I think it has reached its limitation in terms of applying to Chesterfield County for just that particular service. It was 2000, I think you would. Yeah, so 23 years later, um, we are bringing it back, but a completely different service. So we are excited um, to use that link as the name of our microtransit service. So that's, of course, really important to start doing the marketing efforts to get that out there. Um, and it fits within our GRTC family. That was a big push for this, um, whether it's CARE, GRTC, just keeping it in to have that same swoosh or three letters. All right, so the phase one zones, um, these are the five. Um, you know, it's just a little county, um, Powhatan, uh, Ashland, which I'll touch a little bit of Hanover, uh, the Washington Park, and then there's Link and Echo. I'll go into their actual zones. All right, they are in order of planned implementation. So the first one that is for fall, um, uh, fall uh, 2023 is the Washington Park and Bailey Ave. This one looks different than when you guys saw it in January was the last update that I may have given. Um, but originally it was just kind of around the Henrico area, around the Route 93. Um, well, Henrico um, had conversation with Hanover um, about kind of the, the Having a, almost like a pocket zone into the hospital as far as very beneficial um, for Spenrico, but also for Hanover. Um, so that has been expanded to encompass um, once more is more hospital up in Hanover. Um, but a big benefit of this route too is it provides Hanover access to our local fixed route network. So that's pretty huge for the region um, for Hanover and Henrico as well as I mean, like Chesterfield if they want to or um, the Let's start to go all the way um, over. That one has been updated um, and has changed. Um, the next one I think is Ashland. I'm looking at doing this one, and we can still work it through. Maybe after the first one's done, maybe two could be done at the same time. But um, the winter 2023 20, 24, looking at more Ashland. They had some minimal um, speeds. We took some stuff that was further north and shifted it um, further south to there was a lot of um, destination places around that uh, airport that were shifted over and took some stuff out of um, more neighborhood um, than we didn't realize before. But you'll see like, the um, majority of that stayed the same. So, 
Quick question. We've seen a trend in time. Um, Monday through Saturday, Saturday at 6.30 to midnight. Is the, is, is no Sunday a lack of funding or a lack of demand? And we have data that says that. I'm just curious as to the. Yeah, they looked at when they did this proposal, um, like the traffic travels that are happening today from like cars. And I think they tried to match it based on how many were out there that quit time because there was lower demand for Sunday. Does it mean that I can't change? That's what's really great about my car transit. Is that it was so flexible. You don't have to do that long wait. Yeah. Quick booking and advertising. I'm assuming. Is that right? right? Yes, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Yes, except for if the, it depends on how we approach it, when it becomes an internal operation um, and how that ties in with the operator community selection. But that would be at least a year out before that. Um, Chesterfield, similar to the quick print of fall out time. About the same, there is more reach, I guess, Southern or Home Street Road um, for additional service. That added Blue Lion, what it was for, um, further down, another grocery store that was added. But yeah, pretty much the same as it was back in January. So last time I saw the zone, there was more happening on the north side of Wall Street. The zone was pretty balanced between north and south of Wall Street. Right? And it was like um, residential on the north side kind of dropped off. Oh, maybe this hasn't been updated since the last meeting. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. This she looks did tell me that I turned the draft. Okay. Um, okay. Whatever you went over last time, I'll make sure the map is updated to reflect the right one. It's like other than a couple of destinations like post office, there is not. Well, post office is there, but as you know, far as other than yeah, other than a few destinations, there right. there was a neighbor, neighborhood area that was draft. Well, we can talk about that. Um, I don't think she meant right now. Right. <laughs> um, Powhatan. So this one did change um, from last meeting where this one is somewhat similar to what I talked about with um, the Azalea Avenue and Hanover, where Powhatan, um, a lot of their destinations or um, grocery, shopping, and all of that is not as in Powhatan, so they put like the Definitely a need to access Westchester Commons. So they'll have an out of zone access. So something that they go to between the two, uh, but they can go to the Westchester Commons and Island um, as part of their normal. One more. So this is the one I would say is a little bit more flux. Um, I can't just have the original boundaries on here, but the original boundary um, was probably. Two thirds of what you see here. Um, New Kent has asked to expand a little bit to capture uh, a lot of by the older residencies um, that are either already developed or are being developed. So we have it on here, but um, the plan is to go actually out to these communities, had conversations with CFA, um, uh, actually using the service. Um, maybe we start a little bit smaller and it comes in as developments come on and show interest. But that will be worked out with the other two boxes. That's spring of 24. Yeah, probably late spring. Power team, when was that? Same thing, same time. Chesterfield's winter 24. Yeah. Oh, just like it. Um, these were the costs that uh, originally were, and we're staying so busy um, as we do the refinement picture. Budget, but just to update you on those, um, the three that have the asterisks are the three that were funded with the Credit uh, Writer Incentive Program through the COTT, um, so the 86 and third step down model. Um, Palatin and Ashland are Ashland are funded through the RBT demo fund for one year, um, and all of them have their matches uh, with uh, our federal dollars, so there's no dollars at right now. 
um, they'll go back for any sort of bid cycle as well as ensure that we're causing to keep things sustainable as long as possible. Um, and also had conversations with your about, especially for more rural, about three three eleven dollars um, to apply as a contractor um, to keep things going, as well as um, I did not mention, but the Ashland one, or the Ashland Palatin one, um, they also had additional request to have kind of a more specialized transportation um, part of it. Uh, so we are going to do a feasibility study to look at what that would be. So it would be um, that would require just a transportation scheduling in advance. Um, and you would pay a premium, but you'd be able to go out of zone to uh, uh, destinations that have been pre-approved through the specialized transportation program uh, to access the feasibility study is planned for that one, and then applying for funds to do that kind of thing. Uh, as far as next steps, completing all those things that were not 100% uh, yet, so uh, finding a cost uh, for the zone refinement, completing the communication plan. Um, we are in the work and have set interviews with the bunch of transit managers, and we'll have that person on board within the next two weeks. Um, so plenty to do. Uh, procure third party contracts um, for the operations, um, again, marketing and outreach in partnership with the jurisdiction. Okay, we plan on starting that and just continue forever. Um, actually, implementing that first zone um, and the rest soon after. And then um, we have, once you guys approve and board, uh, the next feasibility study for the additional zones. Um, so we'll present this to you from the DPO and DTA. And kick off um, at some point, maybe later this summer. Um, look at the additional zones that would be built in next. Some of them is interest in whether it's in uh, Enrico or um, some of the rural and Manchester buildings ready to go as well with some of those zones so we can start that conversation. Any questions on the detailed version of Microsoft? Four questions. Four. So, are uh, we still talking about um, phasing out is a connector with the implementation of the first zone to Washington? So, the, yeah. Yes, yeah, so that one would be, well, the 93 would go into the September booking, and then the zone would uh, start around the same time, and then 93 would phase out probably in October. Second question, the Ashland zone is kind of stretching south, very close to the Enrico line. We're still a couple miles from where we're going to extend the uh, line. Um, so, is that a bus too far now? Do we wait to phase two extension to VCC and then make that connection then? We look at something like May. That is all exciting things you just said. Yes. Um, you, but let us know what would the rank would like to facilitate the discussion. I mean, ahead of Ashland. Ben it benefits Ashland and Hanover more than it does. Yeah. Right? But it gives you connection to the ground. Yeah. We're close. How close are we to Ashland? Where does BCC is? Uh, which one? BCC is just south of King's Acres right there. Right there. <clears throat> And as you know, that's our goal destination for the next couple of years. The, the um, sports complex is online less than a year from now, and the is coming in, or development coming in. Um, that lower end of Hanover starts. So it would go up somewhere near that. Well, I mean, you're you're right across the interstate from the air park, um, which is in your current zone. Yeah. Um, that block on the lower right. Yeah. So you're probably a mile, mile and a half from BCC. But you're still several, several miles from Reynolds Community College, which is our phase one. Right. Phase. Talk further. Okay, yeah. You're getting close. Yeah. Um, third question is the vehicles you anticipate uh, from the service or CDLs going to be required or not? 
or her uh, talks about it, then like this point in time. Uh, I think And last question is, do you anticipate um, adequate number of vendors interested in providing all these services? Um, I be optimistic that there are. <laughs> I know a couple of them have gone on a like they know. You don't really have a lot of things left. Great. And I know, like, um, we can talk to the ones who are already, like, Bay Transit, for example, and I'm Charlotte's book Buckster, too. So we can talk to their operators to uh, understand how that works. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, you said you're hiring a micro transit manager, and that's someone on staff here. He will be. Um, similar opioids as far as with the palliative, the well, Westchester Commons and the 1A also getting very, very, very close. That almost gives six road access to out of town. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we told them uh, we could see the future extension point further to Westchester Commons. Okay, moving on on the in the agenda to the transit strategic plan. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we have our transit strategic plan, TSP for short. Uh, this is going to be replacing our current TD. Development plan um, as required by uh, Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation. This is going to be a review of an assessment of our services, the settings in which they operate. It's going to develop service and capital recommendations that align with our uh, vision, goals, objectives, uh, and set the stage for our 10 year plan, which is exciting. Uh, the next slide shows the various chapters that the plan covers so strategic vision performance analysis, plan improvements, implementation plans, and financial plan. And as part of this effort, I have a little bit of an activity for everyone. Yay! <laughs> so uh, these same trade-off questions are contractors who work in Foursquare are going to be asking them to our stakeholders, to our um, operations admin, supervisors, operators, as well as doing pop-up events to catch our riders where they are at our various transit hubs. So I thought I'd just have this theme as we did the same ones. So if you had to pick a trade-off here between bus service everywhere and high-frequency service, which are you leaning towards? Which would be more important to you? Which do you think would be more satisfying for our riders? And, and, there's, and the reason is, if you don't have that it's reliable road to get towards the other side of that, it might. I'll see. I, <laughs> In the I can do high frequency <laughs> service in your major corridors and micro transit everywhere that connects. I was thinking 6040 with the heavier focus on. Yeah. I just want to know. I, I was answering your question one or the other. I think we're all right. I think you were saying what we were saying. Right. <laughs> all right. Yeah. 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 Most of these end up being some sort of, you know, somewhere oh, yeah. in the middle. Oh, yeah. uh, next up, we have period, uh, peak period uh, commuter trips or equal priority across the entire day. 
of a preference towards keeping high frequency or keeping high frequency dose towards peak service or expand it out. You're going to wait? Well, I was going to wait, but I, I actually <laughs> think in this case, because of the nature of this doing here, we have to recall that this is sometimes not a choice that people have to use. So I, I think it would be a 60 40 priority, priority across the day. I, I feel like what I've seen you guys do is you have adjusted your frequency of service type depending on demand. Actually, if I can, if I can update. Uh, as I think about this, you, you did just show me this. That one on the right actually does prioritize people using it as an option, not the other way around. So people who are depending on it for getting to work and back tend to lead me to believe that the one on the left, the period commute trips, is the writing by necessity, and the one on the left, writing by necessity on the right. Optional, and so I I think I was I was referring more to the people who didn't have options, which is on the left. Um, but for us to build ridership by the optional riders, that equal priority is going to help them to make decisions of hopping on the bus instead of hopping in the car. So I'd say if you'd ask me a question. Pre-COVID, I would be peak. Now, our our express service is petered out. Um, really picking back up that much. That's by definition peak service. And we found out from the essential worker needs they were just all over. So man, I think I'm more equal priority across the day with adjustments. I mean, you don't need as much on weekends. Tail it off late at night, but you still. That seems really um, sort of individual group. Like you're thinking about each and every group. Do you like pulse your, what, your 10 minutes peak and peak and off peak? So as opposed to Every kind of every five minutes peak in fifteen. So you're you're acknowledging there is some peak demand, but you're kind of say one yeah. or the other. Yeah. Yeah. Is that we had more frequent service versus uh, extended into I think. like what you guys did um, with the supplemental for, to kind of um, pick up the folks that, you know, where you don't really have the demand on the bus, but you still have people that take it. So I'll answer a similar way I answered the last question. Post COVID, more early morning, late night shifts of essential workers. Um, but with some acknowledgement of more frequent service during the maybe back to the 60 But what, what we do know on our routes is the routes that do best are routes with longer hours of service and we can spend a little bit people that when we only ran the seven, uh, which covers each and I go, um, did run the weekends. 
hikes so people could maybe take it one trip to work and then have it on the or on the way home, or they flood out like the bus isn't reliable because it doesn't run when I need it. So we extended hours and days don't because it was more reliable, even though it wasn't running. Um, it, was it was more dependable throughout the day. Again, it kind of depends on the, what the customer is using the service for. Route one, if there's a lot of folks using it to get up and down that corridor for shopping. So, maybe not so much. That's just making assumptions. I don't think. We're going to do um, onboard surveys. It's happening right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. David, well, that was a good data point that you brought up about how we were seeing more ridership. Uh, this one, I was heavily weighted more towards more frequent service. Uh, <clears throat> because again, I think that runs at the core of people looking at that as a viable option. And, and so uh, people need it or are going to recognize whether it's 15 minutes, 30 minutes, or an hour in between uh, when it goes later in the evening. But the more frequent service you have, the more people realize that that actually it's a reliable option from the perspective of if I miss it, miss it, I'm only 15 minutes behind versus an hour. So for whatever reason, I gravitated on this one more like an 80-20 kind of thing in terms of priority. Um, and then the other just reality is, is I would imagine that there tends to be more challenges late night um, in, in public systems like this. And so we have to recognize that as well. So. Uh, can be everything to everyone. We can partner with different services that, that do that in an excellent way. Uh, but I, I just think again, getting that, getting those numbers to just reliably, I, I, I reach for fifteen minutes schedule or whatever. Okay. Last one for activities uh, is keeping with extended existing service area and focusing on improvements to what we're already running or expanding service area. So cheap here and assume that some of this other stuff is happening the way we talked about the other improvements like reliability improvements on existing area. So I would focus on expanding. Make it better known and provide it to a bigger population. Uh, so that we And this goes beyond just this. Does this encompass microtransit as a resource? It's not just local bus service or commuter bus. So when we're talking about expanded service area, yeah, yeah, you should include all those. Okay, I like the expanded service. Area. What what's your timeline? Yeah, this is a 10-year plan. Lean towards expanding service at this juncture and then eventually take that down and then focus on better quality of what, what you've done with it. You can expand everywhere. You know, to touch point out, it's interesting you said it that way. Expand it and then figure out how to best serve it is guessing that when you expand, that we should expect if we expand 10 routes, we're going to find out years later, months later, maybe even, that two of them weren't really great to expand. And we're able to pull back and focus more on those eight. And I think that's a really smart thought is to not put down the stakes that says we must make this decision and we must make it work. That it's not working, it's okay. And we expand it some other direction. Sometimes you don't know what works until you try it. Yeah. yeah We've been there and done that. That's, that's what I've learned with yeah. transit is that you can 
study it all you want, but it's how you really implement it. And adjusting those variables, fine tuning. There's a lot that goes into it and making it successful. what I kind of mentioned earlier, this is all of the different sources that we're getting this feedback, um, in particular from this trade-off questions from. Capture all of them. I mentioned before. Um, next up, we have our engagement schedule. So, origin and destination survey, okay now, uh, stakeholder advisory group meeting, which will be at number one and at number two. It's also going to be a priority survey, which is kind of very similar to what you guys just answered. Um, I think that the operator went last out of the conversations because it will be in groups of 15. Um, so priority surveys to the public, to our stakeholders, operations, uh, employees, and reviews. And then at the end will be another public survey kind of going over the draft recommendations. And then we'll have a finalized TSP. Next slide is board approval schedule. Forgive me, but the committee members, uh, committee board members invited to the uh, um, I believe they, they are going to be invited to the stakeholder meetings. Thank you, Yeah. Second one, Those invites are not. Oh, yeah, but I think just actually, I think Ashley, they are. Yeah, yeah she's not the I can't. Sorry, a housekeeping thing. People are watching on YouTube and they can't hear. This is like a really hard room to be in in terms of like the age back is horrible. We talk really loud. <laughs> Sure. Um, will we have a chance to review the share priorities survey before it goes out? Yeah, we can go that. Hey, John. And I will be missing that SAG if there's a way that I can just have a follow up with folks. Anyone else have? Oh, let me like finish. Oh. Uh, yes, for approval schedule. So I'll add in the recommend the, the survey review as well. Um, let's see, we have CSP and Comfort encompasses also the computer community. Works today, computer assistance program, and our regional uh, public transportation plan. The board of directors for approval at April and January. Any other questions? One question. Did planning staff go through the same exercise we just went through? And so, where did y'all land on? We did it as a. I don't have everyone's comments in front of me from that, but yeah, it was a lot of a. A lot of in the middle. <laughs> Anything else? We'll move on to the advertising policy. So 
Missouri. Okay, um, this has been something in the works for quite a bit, um, but we are finally moving forward um, and Bonnie is online as well um, to help me out with this, but we have gone through um, and completely um, stopped our old advertising policy and basically have this redone a whole new one. Um, the goal to hopefully make this go live. Um, July 1, we do regularly get requests for individuals who are interested in doing advertising, uh, historically offered, offered bus wraps, so we are making work on an advertising program that will um, lead that, but hopefully incorporate a lot more than just bus wraps, uh, which is, would be a great revenue source um, for DRTC and, of course, to support also uh, our zero fares program. Uh, so we looked at some peer agencies and looked at maybe more of them. Um, one that we leaned on quite a bit was um, Hampton Roads Transit. Had, um, I don't know if they've done this recently, um, but they had one that kind of was a best practice that we on. A uh, big difference between this one and our old one, I mean, our old one was probably two thirds of the page, and this one is just a lot more comprehensive, like a lot more guidance. So as, um, and we put a process in place too, so as requests come in, they first go to um, designated individual within marketing, they reference it amongst the um, policy, uh, if there's anything questionable about it, um, it is automatically um, brought to a committee, and the committee includes um, the director, uh, risk management, as well as the staff to be able to review um, all of the requests so that the one individual is no longer um, reviewing all of them and making a decision on their own. That adds a little bit more um, quality control to the whole process. Um, all right, so just going in, uh, political advertising definition is provided. Um, what a nonprofit organization is, and we are extending it and putting a perimeter to it um, to the ge geographical boundary and I'm more, uh, matching um, the MPO boundaries of the metro area. Uh, looking at where we plan to be holistically in uh, terms of service. So, this will apply to all um, whether vehicles would include not just a big drop, but micro transit and all of those as well. Uh, PSAs is defined, um, we do define transit facilities, bus stops, stations, and transit centers, um, and then transit vehicles, which is the all service vehicles, uh, kind of referencing back up, but uh, saying that we're expanding, we also are including um, bus stops, shelters have ad space, um, there's a lot of technology that's coming, including on the buses, they'll all have uh, monitors that have advertising ability within them that can geofence depending on where you're going. Um, so that's an opportunity for advertising. Um, we have Wi-Fi that's going to be eventually on all of our buses, and there's props that come up that will allow us to get electronic advertising. Uh, we have e-signs that will be coming on board, and those also have the ability to have ad space at them. So really expanding this um, from our normal channel cards and bus wraps to technology being a really big uh, opportunity there. Uh, that is not defined here because as things come more on technology, uh, have the right to take it to the program. Uh, requirements uh, will comply with the spirit of ethical laws and regulations of the various jurisdictions, um, must be professional quality, um, nothing that will distract you um, from example, on a bus, we don't want to be flashing in people's eyes. Um, Advertising to put in contest shall ensure the content will be in fairness. Um, after they offer gifts, should avoid uh, representations that would enlarge the value of the item. Um, testimonials should be authentic, so honesty is important. Uh, medical and health related messages may be accepted only from government health organizations. Um, it is currently accepted by uh, the American Medical Association or FDA. Um, advertisers should avoid illustrations or references which disregard normal safety precautions. Um, and then permitted advertising. GHC may display advertisements that fall under one or more of the following categories commercial advertising, um, government advertising, uh, and public service announcements. Take that in. And you guys can, this will of course go to the recommendation. Um, 
So jumping into the prohibited advertising, this is a very long list, um, but we're going to go to advertising that's false, misleading or deceptive, or contains uh, non protected speech, um, gambling or gambling related, including um, monopoly, the lottery, casino, online betting, sports betting. Um, advertising that contains links or portrays images, descriptions of graphic violence, um, and so forth. Um, contains profanity, is obscene or vulgar. Um, Implied and clear endorsement of any product or service or message by G or GC. Women will prominently or predominantly support and this is the comment of any national dispute or war warfare of nations, religions, ethnic, or similar groups. Um, prohibits advertisements of alcohol or tobacco products, e-cigarettes, cannabis, um, and illegal drugs. Advertising for firearms, ammunition, or related. Um, advertising for support or for any political party, um, slate of candidates, or referendums, or ballot initiatives, or anything that is eventually going to be involved. I don't want to have anything related to that. Advertisements that include imagery or language as discriminatory. Based on age, race, ability, sexual orientation, gender, or national origin. Um, advertisements that promote or oppose any religion or religious practice. Um, advertisements that support or oppose energy position or industry goal without any direct commercial benefit to the advertiser. Advertisements that promote unlawful or illegal goods, services, and activities um, or unlawful conduct. Advertisements for Netflix movies. Massage parlors, pawn shops, and check cashing services, uh, promotion of escort service, strip club, uh, or sexually oriented products, um, advertising that takes negativity of the American flag in a disrespectful manner, um, anything that just conflicts with the mission of GRTC, uh, advertising for hiring bus operators and mechanics for providers of bus service other than GRTC. Um, advertisements that spurred the RTC or other agencies or the use of public transportation in general, um, internet addresses, telephone numbers um, that direct viewers, material, images, or information that would violate anything in this final policy, um, content that would violate exclusive sponsorship rights, um, and lowest speech and copyright infringements. Um, the next part just explains the process I mentioned for the code to designate marketing and the committee access. Do it. Um, and the rest is kind of guidelines based on size. Any questions on that? Has there been, I mean, this is also kind of just, I think it's a very important stuff. Um, has there been any analysis done of the advertising that we've done over the last year, two years to identify how much of those that we've done? or some kind of assessment of what our general advertising looks like currently? So it is, the thing about the old policy is more subjectivity, but we follow similar interpretation, I guess, of what it was. So it won't change. It won't be the actual Correct, it will not. Yeah, it just gives us the policy, the guidance, the support, the guidelines, anything that's happened. So in our, just to be, Transparent is that we stopped our policy because we got sued for transparency. Uh, that's what happened. There was just a little bit of ambiguity and a decision was made to deny. Um, and that went through a very, very, very long, uh, I don't know how long was that journal? It's wild. Uh, and we ended up losing that. So the, the folks who wanted to advertise were not permitted, they sued, they won. So this just gives us the actual structure to lean on um, within the program itself. Anything else to add, Bonnie? Would you, would you repeat that? I'm just having a, a kind of a hard time hearing. I'm sorry, I heard it was bad feedback. I just went through all of it and wanted to see if there was anything you wanted to add. Oh, um, no, I, I don't. I think um, the Adrian gave a very um, good presentation. If any of you do have any specific questions about any aspect of the policy, I'm happy to answer them. Adrian, I have one. You mentioned that the Virginia lottery is here. We're not going to allow that. Yeah. 
it's not allowed. That is one that we we were allowed. Sounds like a change is recommended. <laughs> Number two. Um, that's that, that's a pretty big no, I see it, yeah. Yeah, we can make that change. Any comments on that, Bonnie? To add lottery back in? All right, don't, sorry, don't prohibit lottery. Maybe you can be more specific to the Virginia lottery as an agency and not. <clears throat> Maybe there are other lotteries. Yeah, maybe because it's a government related. Is that a true statement? I, Does that yeah. eliminate the lottery as an option? This would right that that if you don't in, if you include that it would in fact prohibit the Virginia lottery from advertising. Okay. All right. It's so recommendation to strike that. Or to rework it. And the question is, do you strike everything or just the lottery portion of that? Is, it, is the, you know, it, it, what is the what is the nexus of the problem of, of item two? Is it creating problem situations for people who don't control gambling? Is that uh, is this part of the of the uh, Test the group that we that we studied and they had it in, and so we put it in. What you know? It certainly doesn't seem like we'd want to eliminate the Virginia lottery, but I, I don't know about the other three. We do get inquiries from uh, casinos as well. Um, Rosie's and there, there's there's more well. and more of them. Right, and the more are coming as well. Yeah, yeah. So should we add that? Should we just strike all of number two? Do you guys want to include? Uh, to me, it seems like that's a pro. A, likely a revenue hit <laughs> uh, because I would think that they would have an interest in advertising on our on our buses. Other thoughts? I'd agree. Okay. You agree to that you strike it, strike strike the entire item. Yeah. Thoughts, Bonnie? My suggestion would be to uh, keep this, but specify non-governmental lottery or something that would still allow the Virginia lottery. Yeah. So you think it's be Virginia lottery? So things like Rosie's or other casinos don't allow. I guess you're saying still prohibit those, but not the governmental lotteries? What, what's the why? I mean, so somebody's gonna turn on their radio or turn on their headphones and they're gonna be hearing a sports book left, right, and center. So why should GRTC lose the revenue? Well, that applies to many things on this list. And further, you have potentially government supported casinos in the region, but don't let the entity advertise. Okay. We can strike the entire thing. Okay. All right. Any other? I think else that stood out, and you guys take it back. I don't have to necessarily if you guys would recommend it as is, or you think it should be something that we will be presenting this also to the finance committee. Uh, and then it can go to full board. I had just a question on number 19 prohibition advertisement that disparages GRTC, any other transit agency, or the use of public transportation in general. I think in reading that out loud, I've gotten my answer. But I guess what I was thinking was basically this is not something that says that I'll just say Uber could advertise on GRTC. It, it's it's suggesting that people should not be using public transit. Is that what that is supposed to cover? Basically, yeah, don't advertise against against public transit. Okay, yeah, public yeah. Transit. I just needed to read that out loud. I'd like to get that in my head. All right, Madam Chair. Fourth paragraph on page one, uh, you reference that uh, it would include but not be limited to, and you have the list, and you include ad panels on bus stop signs. Is that just to be inclusive? That that's not something that y'all are actively pursuing, correct? Ad panels on bus, ad stop. panels on bus stop signs. 
that specifically says sign. So I'm thinking like just sign on the side of the road that you're focusing on. It says sponsored Get, by Geico. Yeah. So we have right now 100 plus little shadow boxes out there. Have you seen them? And that's for our bus stop, adopt a bus stop program. Um, we have like 300 more of them sitting in the church lot. So if people wanted to do some sort of advertising at those, we could also offer. Or the ones themselves um, could have something else sponsored by a particular company. Um, on the individual sign posts. It's not, it's on the post, yeah. It's like, I show them shadow boxes, but they're like this big. Does staff or the board have um, veto power over those locations? My thought is you have something in front of somebody's house on a bus stop. So they potentially find offensive or like the ad itself. The ad itself or the fact that it's there, it's now taking what's a fairly small and conspicuous sign and putting commercial advertising for Yeah, yeah. But the um, shadow boxes aren't at every stop, so I think. No, they're at like 100 right now. Right. And they just look for the adopt a stop program right now. Um, but there's I, nothing to limit it, right? That's, that's yeah, what I'm getting at. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking there would be at the- That could get out of control. Stops, uh, yeah, it just depends on if somebody's interested in cleaning up any bus stop. Um, that's that's adopted spot. That's not right. That's not for the advertising. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, right now. It's included in there as far as being inclusive. We are still developing the program itself, so that's something I mean we would want to get. I think more feedback on as well. Um, it'll have the prices in there. What actually is considered part of the program? Um, maybe if it is a bus stop and what it is. Maybe there's a process where we review it with the, the jurisdiction, um, depending on what it is. I think as long as we have those checks and balances in there, it's fine. Okay. I, I see it being a case by case yeah. basis, because there's 3,000 yeah. stops or whatever, so covering a lot of territory, some commercial areas, it may be fine. Yeah, yeah. maybe I'd have like a Burger King King in front of a no, so just McDonald's or something like that. Out of competition. Right. You're my business, you're my competition. Go and say, well, I'm going to advertise right there. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Get out of hand as long as we have a process to manage that. Yeah, we can uh, definitely bring this back to both the jurisdictions and the board as we develop the program itself. So, Adrian, what did you say as far as action goes? Are this is going to finance? It will also go to the finance, but you guys have to, uh, make a record. Are there more questions? Do we want to make a recommendation to the full board on approving it with that uh, the gambling items removed? I was hoping to do a deep look at it before that. Okay, and when does it go to finance? Today, today. But I mean, the whole thing. I mean, you guys want us to actually do another <clears throat> actual action at the board? If we can do that rather than just being a consent agenda. Okay. So you're planning on taking it to the board at their, what meeting? June 20th. June 20th. Yeah. So you guys can take it, read it. Because there may be Seven further months. edits coming out of the finance committee. Right. That's true. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. All right. Um, related to that one is the Olympic Next 11 and franchise agreement. Um, so this one would ha is a change to um, an ordinance. So this is more of a would like your approval to move forward with working with the city and working with um, I think going to council uh, for this change. Uh, so the franchise agreement um, was established for basically our uh, original purpose was the sponsorship at the poll stations to be, because everything within the right of way of the city um, and the BOT agreement specifically, um, everything except for the comm box and the um, TBMs is becomes part of the city right away. 
so the franchise agreement gives us the ability to still do advertising on certain items like the totem pole, um, some of the, uh, the windscreens today, and it's a five-year um, contract um, with the city, so the limit actually was a year delayed from the start of the poll, so it's another year that it will end up expiring, but it was supposed to go with the small. Um, what this does is it changes the language slightly so that it doesn't just say um, the BRT stations, but expands it to uh, the local stops within the city of Richmond. Um, so everything went over an advertising policy, whether it's, again, these are things that we worked on, but shelter space that has advertising, uh, bus stops if they have what we're getting, or e-signs, which also the ability to do some sort of advertising. Um, so it allows us to not just be limited to the full station to the system as a whole for advertising opportunities. Um, that is kind of the gist of the change for that. So that would go then to uh, council for approval for the change. And again, the term limit is five years. So it would come back here again, years more of the changes to each happen. So you're updating the GRTC city franchise agreement to reflect this advertising policy. So allow us to advertise uh, things beyond the full stations with this. Any questions? Uh, actually, I do. So, will you need some other in place for Chesterfield and Rico? You, I don't know. No. Do you guys have some sort of restriction to that within your? Yes, yeah. so you would. Yeah. Yeah, VDOT has outdoor advertising okay. standards. So, in Chesterfield. <laughs> Need to, if you're putting something in the right of way, you know, it's outdoor advertising. Okay. Um, if you're in an easement, then I would imagine you're applying with the planning department sign policy. All right. Can we work on that soon so that we can? Yeah. Same with yours. What can the language be done? Between jurisdictions? Be extra complicated because we're with B dot N. We took it as extra so. Yeah, take take Chesterfield and the cities and <laughs> meld it up and it's us. I'm ready. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. All right. So we will be coming back with those at some point then. What's next, Joe? Permanent downtown transfer station next steps. Okay. Um, can you actually bring up the word document, Joe? I'll just get into what we're. Yeah. I'm a lot of time, so I will. Say so I'll talk fast. I know I already do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I'll give a quick synopsis. This is just updating you on what what we're. I guess giving you a background, which I'll get into, um, but where we're going next with kind of this approach for the downtown transfer station. Um, you just go down to the pictures, Joe. So you look here, when the network redesign was done at the same time as the Pulse, um, previous to that, we had the transfer plaza where we actually are at the bay today. Um, but at that point in time, we actually had identified a site that we were hoping to move forward with that is very close to what you see on the left, which is around 3rd and Marshall. Um, and we are hoping that everything that was aligned over there could then just be shifted to this transfer site um, that was very close by, and that's how the consultants designed the network redesign. That, that like fell through immediately, um, and therefore we were left here. And what you see is a very disjointed way we made this work. This is the night, the daytime one on the left, so it's all by Third and Marshall. But knowing frequencies kind of reduce, we go to the transfer plaza in the evening, and everything goes there, which just is not optimal. Um, keep going down. Um, all of those together, if you look at the transfers happening, just go to the images, Joe. Um, it's about 7,500 connections that are happening and uh, going down. Um, so this is a little bit of background. Um, we had looked at, this is 2011, because you see how old this is, but like an endless amount of sites that potentially could work for a transfer um, site. Um, 
long story short is that and we were not determined as the best use and public input said that basically there was nothing that would work for GRTC. Um, that's how we ended up in the temporary location we are today because as of 2015, um, the bike race was coming and we just could not be on the Broad Street corridor as they were preparing a lot of infrastructure improvements. Happen. Point down. Um, all right, so with this one, I'm actually going to have you switch to the PowerPoint to that page 26. So what we did um, with the city of Richmond in their non-departmental agreement, which is the grant contract we have funds in it was a line that said that we'd work with um, council and staff through an ad hoc committee to basically um, identify a location um, for our new site and that they would be supporting us to move forward. I think this was like 20. 20 around there when that happened so we had a meeting we had a lot of downtown um, stakeholders that were involved but this is part of the presentation that was shown so ridership activity you can see that the concentrated um, area where they're going we're doing a new o and d but this shows that it really is concentrated in the downtown area that's where a lot of jobs are it's going and coming from you can keep going kind of fast they would just tell the story um, uh, so zooming in to show like the physical locations of where they're actually ending up in the destination. Um, so zooming back in, those are the two, the broad and fourth is the biggest burger circle. The transfer center is the one adjacent to it, the CBC area. And then we have our other bigger connecting points, which is Willow Lawn, we know is huge. 23rd and Franklin, Sam updated you on that earlier. And then Southside Plaza updated you on the facilities master plan that should also include um, consideration for transfer activities. So that's our system as far as where the main connections, but you see those two big hubs downtown. Um, so we then looked at those, zooming in where they're going, keep going, um, and we added in corridors of significance. So what the corridors of significance are, basically those main thoroughfares of being able to access the interstate, um, you see the Broad Street as well, um, knowing that those are two big connection points to really make a frequent network um, to be able to get in and, out, in and out of the city, which is important for transit. Uh, added in just the parcels that were in the downtown area because there's a certain size we're looking for um, to be able to work, which also added some presentation. Uh, next, we looked at, I believe, topography. Uh, sorry. Uh, there you go, that's fine. Topography, in addition to parcels that were larger than one acre, meaning we need a certain size to fit down there and are trained. Um, topography is important because the downtown area, as far as being walkable, even though it may seem like it's close, um, accessibility and walkability are very important and the grade is pretty significant. So that really leaves you more of the plateaued area um, if you're trying to access the sites. Um, it everything together, ridership, pulse, all of it, kind of honing in and giving you a perimeter. So that's what that purple line is. If you tried to find a particular place, um, that gave us a, a, a place to look at. Go to the next one. So overlaying this with what was done back in 2011, you have um, some of the similar sites that were identified. What we've added on here are the city of Richmond um, parcels that have identified as surplus, um, surplus um, by council as identified within the red and that site eight I believe is um, where we are yes that is no that's not true and site nine is where we are no back to site eight site eight I believe is where we are with the eighth and clay lot um, for our temporary location so that one um, actually fit with, with a kind of short term need but also was where we kind of could be um, keep going to the next one too. Um, so the ad hoc committee was, a, I don't remember how many, but it was a lot of people, a lot of downtown, downtown, downtown representatives that were identified as well as additional stakeholders. Um, and they were asked in discussion, um, question one, permanent transit center should be within an uh, area identified. Do you support transit-oriented development? And then set up some design preferences. Can you go back to the um, word doc now, Jim? And so what the Word doc shows is the results of this. So you can see um, around 60% of those identified that it should be um, within the area identified. So that's a perimeter that kind of tells the story about um, 
29 percent or 30 percent said that it should be good in, outside of the area and then as far as the perspective of transit-oriented development looking at creative ways that could really bring in more of a mixed-use development and also um, facilitate the growth in the downtown area very very important um, at eight so um, unfortunately after this meeting uh happened we had to pivot because that's the public safety building was uh, sold and we had to change all of our efforts both the staff in the city as well as GRTC to find a home because they told us we had to get out as soon as possible um, that as we know fell through but that did lead us to where we are with downtown transfer station uh, keep going down Joe so the approach with this and this just shows um, some of the property values that have happened based on the TOD related to Pulse um, just so significant showing this is from the Greater Washington Partnership um, of once the implementation happened in 2018 that you really see those numbers um, drive up so really transit does make such a huge difference when done in planning efforts to your point earlier with the land use and all of that um, with the Pulse that a similar effort with keeping trans in the downtown area and having proper infrastructure investment where people are is important and can be done right. And then going down further, um, just making sure we're incorporating it in a huge opportunity right now as they are doing the uh, Richmond 300 investment and um, with city center, which is kind of where we would like to be. Um, so it would be ideal for us to kind of uh, work with that and come up with a product that included GRTC. You go in a little bit more, Joe. So the request of this, um, sorry, go back up three. So what came out of the final study, um, sorry, the ad hoc committee was kind of next steps with the city um, to begin the BRT expansion project. Um, that happened. Identify permanent location design will benefit the region and riders as well as provide the best economic le leverage the downtown city and they align the poles and north south and transfer center strategically to be considered for implementation um, with other regional projects in the future. So we're kind of at two and three now, bringing it back up almost three years later to be able to get it going. Um, so we have we have just put this out, or it's going out soon, right, Sam? The uh, RFP for it is on the street. On the street. Um, so just going to want to give you guys an update. So hoping you guys can help us champion this and go from saying we are not the best use of was that 13 different sites, but actually helping us creatively come up with something that is great for investment for the city, incorporates us into, I guess, the fabric as well as shows um, transit as helping be almost a catalyst to the transit oriented development um, within the region as well. So going down a little bit further, kind of the goals of that, keep going, keep going. Um, so. Uh, we want them to uh, do kind of a condition report, coming up with three to four, five sites that would work, um, looking at a market analysis in coordination with the Richmond 300 plan, um, and then perform a preliminary conceptual site plan based on kind of what is worked out. Um, and then looking at it in terms of the financial aspect of whether it's a P3, let's be creative about this because we do have federal dollars, but now we are have other dollars that also could um, help leverage it that is different than we were back in even 2020 and um, previous to that. So we're hoping that we can bring this to a point where we actually have a site selected and actually can move towards design, but it can be included kind of in the fabric of the Richmond 300 project. So the thing that's really different this go round, or when you're pulling this back up is the highest and best use trying to address that issue that has been the problem in the past. That has been the, yeah, the problem, so sorry, this just shows um, an example of kind of a mixed use development in other places. So I think the perception before has always been that we would be a surface lot taking up a parcel. And um, yeah, that's true. That's not necessarily the best use of a downtown area. It doesn't have to be the way that it's designed. I mean, it can be designed another way that incorporates all of the above, retail, um, government, transit, um, affordable housing, whatnot, and that's some of those examples of what they show. So if we could approach it that way, rather than just GRTC gets a parcel and it's no longer on the books, um, but bringing in other players where it's not just GRTC. Also, even with the Navy Hill project, where we were part of that, but I know the finances, us having federal dollars was very different. So if we can approach that before we even get to the point of, um, talking about a design and understand ways that we actually can make this work, I think is different. And we have other 
um, more capital dollars that could be used for leveraging beyond just the federal dollars also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does seem like there are lots of um, different pieces that are falling in place that make this challenging topic that we've been, or you guys have been wrestling with since 2011. Yeah. Actually, maybe come together. That's right. I'm hoping so. Yeah, yeah. And then I guess as you guys, as, as champions and knowing how this works, I mean, with your different perspectives, you, of course, um, from the private as well as the development um, kind of background is useful. And then you guys with all your jurisdictional stakeholder knowledge. I think it's just very, very beneficial. Is, is, that was not in here. Is that in the process of being edited? Or is it available? I can us? share it with you. Obviously. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, it was just the, the scope, and then it shows the, the presentation that we had last time. So I guess that's both of you. Okay, great. Other questions on uh, the permanent downtown transfer station process? Next steps. I have no question. Okay, that's surprising. Thank you. <laughs> um, any other business? All right, seeing none, then we are adjourned. Thank you. This was a good meeting. It Sorry. was really good. Um, you're out of town next week, right? Yes. Okay, I'm late right now for a Zoom meeting. I'm just going to touch base with you.